kind of obvious, I think, by now that this is the first Sunday of Advent. And when we think about communion, usually what we think about is not the Advent, but we think about the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, going to the cross, suffering and dying for our sins, and then his resurrection from the grave, uh, which is, becomes for us the key to life and death. So to tie in Christmas, Jesus' birth with the communion seems to some people to be a little bit different. And yet Christmas and communion are so tightly woven together that they fit better than the old phrase that you hear, uh, glove and hand. You know, they go together. Uh, you know, you can have a glove or a hand and without a glove, and unless it's extremely cold or rough work, uh, your hand will still work. But without a hand, the glove itself is pretty worthless. It's not, it doesn't have a purpose. On the other hand, Christmas and communion are tied together as one. Basically, you can't have one without the other. It has been said uh, by somebody else, but I like the phrase. It's been said that without Christmas, communion is just a tiny Sunday snack with friends. And Christmas without communion is just another holiday to sell toys and make money. Of course, we realize that's what most of the world thinks anyway. But the two go hand in hand. In a sense, I think that's exactly what the prophet Isaiah was speaking about in Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, where it says, For a child will be born unto us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. In this passage, you have the virgin birth. Then you have the ending, which is the everlasting kingdom. And the cross is the thing that tie the two together. You know, we can have a birth in our life. We are all born. But the cross is what ties us for the hope of eternal life uh, at the end. It is our devotion to the Christ of the cross that basically ties our life from now on into the present age. And the communion service is an expression of our belief in the power of the cross. Jesus' sacrifice for us and its ability to reconcile us to Yahweh. It reminds us of the necessary, necessity of living lives des dedicated to obedience to the Lord. It's interesting the names by which the child should be called, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, and that's a term that people get all uh, heated up about. And it probably is a poor translation in most modern Bibles. If you go back and look at some of the Bibles that were uh, commonly used as reference, when I was growing up, uh, you had translations that better treated the Hebrew word. Uh, translations like, for that phrase, they say, godlike hero, a divine hero, or in battle, godlike. Jesus, just to illustrate the misunderstanding, many of the reform leaders of the Reformation movement, many of them did not believe that this was saying that Jesus was God. Uh, Martin Luther himself translated this phrase into the German words, which in the English mean strength hero. And he explained this epitaph belongs not to the person of Christ, but to his work and office. Uh, and when you realize uh, in, birth, or in the next chapter, Chapter 11, you have the picture of the Messiah coming in battle array to take over the earth. You begin to understand that this could probably well be traveled or translated, he is mighty in battle. Uh, that's probably what they're talking about here. It goes on to say he's the eternal father or literally the father of the eternal age. Uh, Jesus, through his death, enabled or fathered the eternal age to come. He is the prince of peace. Uh, and again, these names are connected with the future 
as shown in the next chapter. One of the things that we sometimes skip over this when we read Isaiah, we don't think about, is he says the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Basically, it points out that God was excited. He was passionate about Jesus' birth, even realizing uh, what would happen to Jesus, uh, his only begotten son, and yet he was passionate about it because of what it was doing. It was bringing salvation to his creation. God's plan was to give his only begotten son to die on the cross that peace might be restored between he and his creation. So in this communion service, uh, in a sense, this service is showing God elated to provide for his creation, but brokenhearted when he would have to leave his son, his gift that he gives us, to a horrific, untimely, and innocent death, bearing the sins of others. We know the Bible says that he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. But he also knew that by his stripes we are healed. That brings us the healing and the hope for eternal life. We enter into his death symbolically when we accept the Lord in the waters of baptism. And communion reminds us of the promise that we made when we accept the Lord. It's a promise not to do what is right in our own eyes, but to do what the scriptures tell us to do. And Paul, in giving us this service or telling about it, said, let a man examine himself and then let him eat and drink. We examine our lives because of the warning that's given also there in Corinthians, that if we don't examine our lives, we can eat and drink damnation to ourselves because of our relationships not being what they should be. Uh, and so it's an important time, I think, for us to sit and personally reflect on our lives. And I'd suggest at this time of the year, it would be a good time for each of us to reflect on how we allow Christmas to reign in our lives. Whether it's the toys and the gifts and all the hoopla that goes around with it that has nothing to do with the Savior's birth. My wife and I watch a lot of Hallmark movies this time of the year, all their Christmas movies. And very few of them have Christ in it anywhere. It's all about love and romance and uh, getting together, you know, uh, into a loving relationship. But it's nothing about, it's nothing about Jesus. And I'd suggest that each of us should determine as we examine our lives to let the meaning of this season to be renewed in our lives as we concentrate on Jesus' birth the gift that God gave us. As we... Almighty God, it is in humble adoration of you and the giving of your Son that we come before you now. We thank you for the fact that we do have forgiveness of sins that comes through your Son. And this communion service is a reminder of his life and what he did for us. So Father, now we pray that you would help us to set our hearts and our minds for the next few minutes to your son dying on the cross for us. It's in his name we pray.